So I'm here to talk about living services, um, and thank you for having me in Dublin to do so. Um, I'm one of the founders of Fjord. Uh, we're a design innovation company. We were acquired by Accenture Interactive two and a half years ago. Uh, we're now 600 people, 600 designers, um, in about uh, in 18 cities worldwide. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about what I'm going to talk about now. And it's living services is coming about really because there are two main um, things sweeping across our industry when we think about um, consumers, users, and digital experiences. The first is di the digitalization of everything. So I think there is a sort of um, a wonderful, a sort of marquee point happening this year, which is that Hilton and Starwood have announced that they're um, putting sensors in their hotel doors so that you can open them with your smartphones. So I think this is very important. It doesn't sound very important, but it is. It's important because all of a sudden, something that was previously extremely stupid, a hotel door, has become just a little bit cleverer. Don't let anyone tell you it's a smart object. It's a fairly dumb object now, rather than a completely dumb object. But it has got a little bit more intelligence. And I think the two significant things of that are not so much that I'll be able to open a hotel door with my smartphone, but that the hotel will know I've done so and can then use a wearable to talk to a cleaner to tell them what time they can go and clean my room. Now, that actually transforms hotel efficiency much more than it transforms me when I open the door. The other option of it, which I think is important, is that suddenly hundreds of thousands of people all over the world are going to be experiencing doors which are a little bit intelligent. And they're going to be looking at their connected cars and thinking, this has become a bit more intelligent as well. And they're going to be looking at all sorts of stuff around them in their environment and thinking, what else might be digitized? And what else could I do with the digitized thing? So I think we are at that tipping point where people become conscious of the significance of the digitization of everything. The second thing we talk about a lot is liquid expectations. So this is the theory, not just the theory, the reality, that most industries are no longer competing with their direct neighbor. Uh, they're now competing with their experiential competitors. So a great example of that for I is Uber. So the first time you step out of an Uber, or, or a Halo cab, as I did here in, in Dublin yesterday, the first time you step out of a cab and walk away from it without paying, because the payment happens in the cloud, and your receipt gets sent to you digitally, that's a, a marquee moment. And everyone understands that cashless payments, or, or, or paymentless payments in a way, um, become something that they want all the time. So if Uber and Halo can do it, why can't other people, why can't shops do it? Why can't hotels do it? Why do I have to go and do that checkout thing? It's so boring. So suddenly you're competing for expectations. My expectations of what I will get are flowing seamlessly across industries. And industry boundaries become count for a lot less as a result. So we think we're entering this third era. The first two, for reference, um, are web and internet started, what, 94, 95, depending on, on how you want to count it. The second is mobility. Make no mistake, we're still in the middle of the mobile uh, revolution. There's still lots to learn. We have not done it all yet. But unfortunately, coming along unstoppably is now this third wave we call living services. And the significance of this is these are accretive. They're building on one We can't do living services without mobile. Mobile wouldn't really have happened without, without the initial web and internet revolution. And the second significance is they become more complex. So as these things begin to happen, so we're dealing with much greater forces of complexity. Think of it just from a designer's perspective. Eight years ago, we were thinking largely in digital design about a screen that big and a keyboard and a mouse. Now we're thinking about multiple screen sizes down to a watch, and in some cases, no screen at all. We're using interaction paradigms, which are no longer just about typing, but also about touch, swipe, voice, gesture, and location. So complexity builds as we go through this. Why do we call them living services? The first reason is because these things will actually be alive. They will change in real time. Um, and if you want to see a great example of that, actually a, a, a competitor of ours is demonstrating on the Ford stand right outside, and, and I talked to him earlier on, I suggest you go and have a look, because they're using data to change the design actually in real time. This is a profound change in the way we will experience services, so much so that what we now use on the web and on mobile will look like uh, silent black and white movies in comparison to what comes next. And this, will, this transition will take place over the next five to 10 years. The second reason we call them living is because they'll be largely experienced through wearables and nearables, things in the environment all around us. And the third reason is because they're going to change our lives in truly profound ways, the like of which, frankly, the di digital so far has not really done in quite the level that we're going to see. And, and I think we will look back in, I'm confident we will look back in 20 years' time and say 2015, round about now, was the tipping point when things really began to accelerate up in terms of the societal change that we saw as a result.
There's a small paradox here, though, which is these things are going to change our lives in small ways. Um, I, I, a client I was talking to recently, the CIO of Sainsbury's in the UK, I was, I was telling him about this, and I was saying, this is about a lot of small things that will change, the way light bulbs work, the way our heating works, things that happen when we approach our cars, etc. And he said, ah, you're talking about taking things off the thinking list. And that, it, that, that sums it up brilliantly. That is exactly what this is about. There will be some areas where we see sweeping changes. So driverless cars is a very good example. But largely, this is about the aggregation of a large number of small changes. And I'm going to show a short video which demonstrates that. So I'll be the first to admit that it's in the nature of videos like this to be quite superficial. I know that. Um, but what's useful about this is to unpick it a bit, and we don't have time to do so, unfortunately, now, but to unpick it a bit and begin to think about what does this mean in terms of the technology and the design and then the organization of a company required to deliver these separate little units of activity. Because all of this is going to happen in a great number of different areas. And these are the environments we think are going to be profoundly affected. We've written a, a document on this, and you can find it on our website. We haven't got time to go into detail on all of them, but I'm going to single out one, which is our homes. And I want to single out homes because we think this is going to be an absolutely key battleground. We're seeing very good examples of this happening. And in particular, I would highlight what Amazon have done in the last year with Echo, um, Alexa, and Buttons. Uh, and also, of course, the vast investment that Google are making in this space as well. Those are two companies particularly to watch because they're going to be fighting head-to-head. -head. And there will be other players in here as well, utility companies, telcos, etc., trying to take advantage of this area. Uh, and we've certainly seen from our own research that consumers, when they think about the Internet of Things, um, are largely focused on what will happen in the home with the Internet of Things. So why is this happening now? In a word, it's cost. So. Um, the technology has been there for a while. Nothing I've said about the technology so far would surprise anybody, but it's about the connected devices, the sensors, more or less ubiqu ubiquitous network connectivity, not quite, um, the cloud, data. It's about ways in which uh, UI itself is evolving rapidly. I talked about gesture and voice. We're seeing a big uptick in the uh, pickup of voice now. All of these things have come together, and it's relatively cheap, or Hilton and Starwood wouldn't be putting sensors indoors. So what do businesses do about this? 
the first thing they have to do is they have to know their customer. So those hotels need to know their customer better than anybody else knows them. That's one of the reasons why the hotel, why the doors are also significant, because it gives them just a little bit more data on their customers. And they have to know their customers better than anyone else. The second thing they've got to be able to do is create incredibly flexible technology which can deliver components of experience to customers whenever and wherever they want it. Those two, however, are not enough because you can't know everything that's called God and you can't flex ultimately. That hasn't been invented yet. So in the meanwhile, before we become God and we can flex everything, we have to make some choices, and I would call those design choices, maybe they're strategic choices, about what you choose to try to know and know better than anyone else and how you're going to flex. Because these things are going to be designed around individuals. I've heard since the beginning of my career about one-to-one -one marketing, and I have to say I've pretty rarely seen it in action. I think it still sucks um, as a concept. But this is about one-to-one -one services, and that we are about to see. So how do we do this? So um, the biggest challenge of all is probably, and it sounds rather dull and dry compared to interesting stuff like design, is how organizations configure themselves. And Within that, I would particularly pick out a challenge, which is those companies which remain ruthlessly focused on silos and efficiency for its own sake are going to struggle in the era of living services. The ones that succeed will be the ones that show flexibility. So you'll see on this chart um, the word volatility at the bottom. Volatility is not a word that you typically associate with large corporations as being a good thing. It's certainly not something most COOs or CFOs would want to see. But I'm proposing it to you is actually a very good thing in the era of living services, that the organizations which really adapt to living services are the ones which show a high degree of volatility and level of digitalization. So most organizations are still stuck in the solid mode. The ones that have evolved a bit more, largely media companies right now, because they've been dealing, um, they've been having hand-to-hand -hand fight with digital for the last 20 years, they've moved into a liquid stage. So liquid is good, at least you can move a bit more around the customer. The problem with liquid is it tends to flow through preordained channels. We call them rivers or streams. So it's not actually as flexible as it needs to be. The real winners in this space will be the ones who conceptually imagine themselves as gas, not as solid or as, or as liquid, and who are able to flow their service into any space where the customer wants it. Um, and, and of course, the really clever ones will be, will be plasma, which is gas that conducts electricity or so, I'm assured. I'm not a scientist. Um, and, and I think at the moment, probably Google. Google now is probably an outstanding example of this. I think Spotify are undoubtedly up there. When you look at the way Spotify is flowing through, um, I mean, I never, you can't experience Spotify in the raw, unless presumably you work there. You, it's always mediated by something else, iOS or Google or Sonos plus Apple plus, plus Google, um, or, or now through a Ford motor car, or through Runkeeper, uh, or through Uber. They've been brilliant at atomizing their product. They're truly a company that's seen that being plasma is the right way to go. And really, that's the main point here, which is you have to atomize your brand and service. The ones that win will be the ones that are able to take their component parts and create both digital APIs, but actually, I believe, physical APIs into them so that the brands become alive. And lastly, this has a huge impact on design. Um, as a design company, it would be difficult for us not to comment on this, but in particular, just the two things to take out of this. And, um, again, I saw a lot of this on display on the Ford stand, which I thought was, was hugely interesting. We're going to be working much more with designer, so with data. So for designers in the audience, um, you can't really look at the next five years without developing right now a deep um, appreciation of data, both in terms of not only using it to design a service, but actually designing services which spew data out back to, the, back to the host in order to be able to change the nature of the service in real time that then flows back to the customer. So this is not just about using data to design, it's also about designing for data to be created in order to change the service dynamically. That's Living Services. Thank you very much for your attention.